we're going back to Worcester in, um, say, about 1820, if you arrived here at that time. Uh, this is really what you would, uh, that's, yeah, that's uh, this is what would have, you would have been met with, because if you came to Worcester by um, boat, you would have come underneath the, on the River Severn up from Bristol, you came under the bridge, and there, uh, before the side of the cathedral, a huge advertising sign saying, Flight and Bar, Royal China Manufactory. You couldn't miss it, and they're very proud. Royal was all that it was about. Um, but if you were the other side of the cathedral, and you came to Worcester, not by boat, but by, uh, by uh, uh, road, you would pass through the Bath Road Turnpike, and there um, you would see an even bigger advertising sign that proudly tells you Chamberlain's China Manufacturers to HRH, the Prince Regent. I, mean, I don't think the folk of Worcester would allow such advertising today, but they really both wanted to show off um, and their royal uh, warrants, royal backing and royal patronage was worth far more than anything else at the time. I mean, it all started back in 1788. That was the, the first royal visit to Worcester. And uh, that was when uh, George III came here. Um, I mean, he was the, uh, was, uh, he came to Worcester for the music meeting, the start of the old Three Choirs Festival. And um, he spent a few days in Worcester, and it's it said that while he was here, he was showing his first signs of madness. And certainly his behavior was a bit odd. He was often found missing from his bed and disappeared around the city. But on one day, he got up quite early and dragged poor Queen Charlotte with him, and they went walking down the high street in Worcester and stopped at an empty shop. It was, it was the only one that was open that early in the morning because the workmen inside were still fitting out Chamberlain's new china shop. Um, the china was all packed up in boxes, but the king went inside and said, I want to see what's going on here from top to bottom. So uh, in he went with Charlotte, climbing up staircase after staircase, right up to the attics, where he said, oh, come Charlotte, sit down, I'm rather tired and amongst wood shavings and tools, sitting the king and queen on the top uh, of the stairs in Chamberlain's shop, laughing their heads off at the strange circumstances they found themselves in. But Mr. Chamberlain must have been horrified to think, well, his wonderful porcelain was all packed up. He couldn't show it to the king because later that day when he'd recovered a bit, uh, Charlotte and George went to Flight's factory. Um, and it was the rivals who got the royal visit uh, that year. And uh, they received some wonderful orders for porcelain. It was the, um, so 1788, the first royal sets being made for the king. And I mean, the king was fairly practical. He, he wanted China he could use and just chose some patterns he liked. Um, the king liked the lily pattern. And in his honor, they renamed it as Royal Lily, the name it's been given ever since. Um, and Charlotte, she liked this whirly pattern in the Japan taste in blue and red, and that became known as the Queen Charlotte pattern in her honor. And sets of each were delivered in due course to uh, the royal households and were used. Those pieces made for the king himself have a little gold um, crescent and crown on the back. But anyone can buy these patterns today. They're very affordable and you can eat like the king. But um, there's the early set, Chamberlain um, must have wanted some royal orders, but to begin, begin with, it was Flight who got the royal warrant. 1789, it was signed off. Um, so the king gave his own um, favor to Flight's. But Chamberlain were uh, keen to supply a service. And this is perhaps the first of the uh, Chamberlain royal sets that was produced um, around 1789 or at that time. Um, it's known as the King of Hanover service, but it's a little bit of a mystery. Um, a few of the dishes like this one have old labels on the back saying it was made um, by, uh, to order for George IV to give to the King of Hanover. But as George III and George IV were actually the King of Hanover themselves, it's hard for them to give the set to themselves. So we don't really know uh, much about it, but it, it's there in the royal household today. If you go into the um, Clarence House, in the entrance hall at Clarence House, you can see this wonderful display of a Chamberlain set 
with um, historical scenes painted in, in colors in the middle of it. But uh, I think it's a little bit there by false pretenses because it's, it's said that it was the Queen Mum who bought it at the Grosvenor House Antiques Fair because she managed to get a very good discount. But it looks very nice in Clarence House. So it's become a royal set by default anyway. But there's plenty of them to, uh, to, to join it. Um, it was really the king's um, patronage was so important. And he, he did the, the good thing by persuading his family to start buying sets from flight. It was the king's brother who uh, had the first set made for him. Um, and this was the, the next year, 1789, this was produced for the Duke of Clarence. Uh, that was uh, one of the king's several brothers um, Clarence later became King William IV, and he had a, a great love of porcelain during his life, and he had this set produced, and in a way it was quite a startling and, uh, and uh, controversial pattern at the time because of the bright colours, um, that wonderful border of ribbons made to celebrate the king's, uh, well, the, the, the Duke's um, accession to the title of Duke of Clarence and St Andrew. And so this has the orders of the Thistle and St Andrews and the Garter all around the border and the royal arms there in the middle. And it was delivered to uh, Clarence. Uh, parts of it still remain in the royal household. There are 13 plates from the set which haven't got broken, but various bits are gathered in collections around the world, including this plate which stayed here at Worcester and is, is, is here in the cabinet right next to me as I'm speaking, a, a splendid set indeed. I mean, these were whole services and the creation of a royal set really involved quite a bit of um, fought and, and, uh, uh, and, and also um, uh, fighting over the, who was going to get the commission. Um, the Clarence liked his armorial set and he wanted a new one, another one. And this time he wanted a painted center and wonderful rich border. But rather than just go to flights alone, he, uh, he put it out to tender. He asked other factories, Derby in this case, to come up with their sample. And the different factories to, went to visit the uh, Duke with specimen plates. And these are two of these specimens. The uh, 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 Prince luckily um, chose, or the Duke as he was then, chose flights for the order rather than Derby. I mean, how could you do anything else really? And um, he um, chose, was given the choice of subject. He could either have peace and plenty or patience or hope. And of the ones, he chose the border that went with the patient's plate and um, hope painted in the center. And so it was all agreed and the, the cost was agreed, 700 pounds for the whole service it was gonna cost. And they had one year in which to complete the whole dinner set. And it was, uh, Worcester only had one painter. They only had poor old John Pennington, um, who was um, a prolific painter, but he had to be, because he had to paint the whole set himself and an awful lot of other China as well, because he was the only main figure painter they'd got. But he painted all the centers in this service with hope there um, in this wonderful big oval dish. Um, one of the specimens that they kept here at the factory, and it's here in the museum. So uh, after, it was only a month or two late, which wasn't bad for um, uh, considering that one painter did the whole thing. And um, in 1790, it went up to London, but before they delivered it to the Duke of Clarence, they um, put it on exhibition in the London showrooms. Uh, quite usual for these sets to be put on display so everyone could see how magnificent they were and then they could all order their own and the um, importance of having a royal set um, meant you get more orders as a result and in this case from other royalty um, the, the, the duke's brothers liked it this is for another brother of, of the king this was um, made for the duke of gloucester um, and he had a set, he, he liked the one that Clarence had, but um, he said, I, I want colours. Um, and he, he chose the patient subject that um, the uh, Duke um, Clarence had rejected. And so here we have the um, plate made for the Duke of Gloucester, 
Um, and his set was produced with wonderful rich gilded borders. But uh, it wasn't all the same subject. Um, rather confusingly, it was a Harlequin set. This was to become the norm. Um, in the centers of each piece was something rather different. Some of them had flowers, some of them had shells, feathers or birds and uh, landscapes. And so each center was something different. The two pieces on the left of your screen, samples from the set made for the Duke of Gloucester. And um, his, he persuaded his son to have a set as well. And five years later, the new second Duke of Gloucester, um, uh, in memory perhaps of his father's taste, um, he ordered a set also from Flight and Bar with the um, new badge of the Gloucesters on the top. And this time painted with landscape by Rogers. And this was to become the fashion. If it was good enough for the king and his, and his brothers and the royal family, then other nobility and gentry would want similar sets. And they all queued up at flights to have similar sets made for them. Uh, this is the Harlequin service ordered for the Earl of Plymouth. And uh, for his set, um, he had, uh, again, uh, 12 plates painted with flowers, 12 plates had shells, Others had landscapes, both in Britain and around the world, that reflected the travels that the Earl had gone on. And uh, 12 of the plates had rather curious costume figures painted in the middle. Um, you could have whatever you wanted painted on your Worcester plates. Um, in this case, united by this amazing gilded border and a very splendid set as well. So, um, and everybody now wanted one. Viscount Gort had a similar set and flights were kept nicely busy producing Harlequin sets for everybody who, who would be able to pay the very huge price that they commanded. But is the, the sets made for the king perhaps are the, the ones that we remember the most and the most important for getting further orders. And, and George III himself wasn't a particularly great customer. I mean, he bought a couple of sets from flights because they, he was the, um, they were, he had the warrant for making these pieces, but um, they were perhaps um, uh, blended as well. Two sets ordered in 1805 and probably 1811, it's not quite sure when they were actually produced, but uh, one has the orange border and pale orange ground known as Bar's Orange in honor of the owner of the factory. It's a very distinctive color and was a favorite of um, Flight and Bar and Bar Flight and Bar as they had become when they received this order. Um, the order from the king came to the London shop for a set with lovely blue ground, um, tooled gilding around the border with all the oak leaves and insignia of the king. And in the middle, very splendid royal arms painted carefully on every piece. And uh, these services produced for the king's own use and promptly delivered to him in London uh, after they'd been completed. And, but um, the king say he was quite pr practical. Um, he didn't believe just in having sets to show off and to um, put them away. They were meant to be used. And uh, um, he certainly um, made every use of the, the services that were produced for him. And um, in the royal household, um, one of the plates here shows that it, it's actually had quite a bit of use. It, the plate is well worn and rubbed. You can imagine um, uh, endless helpings of royal kippers eaten off this plate, um, regularly used by, uh, uh, by uh, George III um, himself and Charlotte. Um, and so sadly a bit rubbed, but um, one knows from the specimens and from the teapot, which is also there in the Royal Collection, looking wonderful, how beautiful the gilding and the uh, quality of the decoration on this set that the King used to eat of. But it was uh, for a, a, a mere two sets for the King, far more were ordered by his son, uh, who had a great deal of interest in porcelain. Um, these are specimen plates made for the first order from the Prince of Wales, um, who um, patronized um, the two Worcester factories very much indeed. 
Um, and uh, the Prince of Wales um, loved porcelain in uh, every ways. The, the, he felt he had to have a, 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 initially some formal sets, and this was um, for state occasions, a rather grand set in the traditions of um, the of flight and bar and the sets made for his father. Here we've got a blue ground with gilding. Um, the prince favored the wonderful raised tool gold that was hugely expensive and the full arms in the middle. And um, in the, the factory kept back two specimen plates shown here, um, for, which was presented to the prince in order to choose how the set was going to look. So you've got um, a plain border or a rich gadroon edge. And rather curiously, the prince chose the plain one um, for his taste. He would, I would have expected a bit more um, complexity, but he had the set then produced with the rich gold border and the badges of the uh, Prince of Wales plumes and crowns and the royal arms put on every piece. So here in the museum, we can see specimens that were presented for this set and the real, real ones then went to the royal, royal households and were used very regularly um, in, um, in different state occasions. But here we have uh, other samples. What is always difficult in the museum collection um, is to know which one of these were actually made and which ones were purely prototypes and specimens, because you didn't necessarily uh, have the every, every, every set commissioned, and you didn't get all the orders. Factors had to submit their proposals um, in the form of these samples or specimens, and then customers could choose what they wanted, and hopefully they would win the, the day and get the orders. And in this case, three different sets from flight, but probably only one of them was ever actually completed. Uh, the set on the bottom, or, or a cup and saucer there, beautifully painted with flowers by Samuel Astle's um, wonderful painting of the flowers. And all of these in the, the formal taste with the prince's plumes and the, the royal badges in the middle. And these samples kept back by the factory for their own collection and their own museum. But the, of course, the um, uh, uh, Prince of Wales was, was, was really, um, one, uh, loved the different uh, porcelain services being made for him. Um, his probably really um, reputation as for spending um, is greater than that of, uh, of anything. And uh, we perhaps rather sort of know him for his extravagance and uh, perhaps none more so than the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. That's probably what he, he's best known for, the sheer cost of that. But that wasn't the, uh, the half of it. Um, Brighton was just a mere part of his huge expenditure. And uh, it was rather controversial just how much money he spent. But um, almost uh, more than anything else, he spent a lot of it on porcelain. It was one of his many great obsessions. He just couldn't get enough of it. Um, and the richer, the better. And so he ordered porcelain sets from all the China factories of um, Britain. Um, he went to the Welsh factories and Swansea and Nangaroo, uh, Derby, Spode. Everybody made a, a Prince of Wales pattern of one sort or another. And um, somehow the prince managed to find room for all of these. And occasionally he managed to pay for them as well, but not very often. In 1807, he went on one of many tours around the country. Um, he went to the potteries and ordered china there. But he came to Worcester and he went on tours, not just of flights, but of Chamberlain's as well, the two factories rivals in Worcester. And he asked for sample plates to be made at both. And he loved what he saw. I mean, these are plates which are behind me in here in the museum, two of the most splendid Worcester plates ever made. And these were samples for services to be produced for the Prince of Wales in 1807. And they are uh, very much his taste. Well, his taste um, all over um, the rich Japan taste. It's a sort of mock of China, Japan, and uh, Regency England all thrown together in one. And nobody did it better than flight, uh, bar flight and bar on these uh, samples. You can imagine this in the pavilion, because this is exactly the Prince of Wales's taste. 
um, the regent taste indeed. And dragons, beasts, and fanciful colors. Um, this um, looks the part exactly. So you could imagine this set in the Royal Pavilion. But, and that's where it was probably intended to go. But I, I fear it wasn't actually produced. Maybe it just cost too much. But or the prince's loyalty went elsewhere for across the uh, uh, further down the road in Worcester, he was ordering other sets from Chamberlain. I mean, the cartoonists of the day um, made great fun. Oh, well, he was the perfect character, the perfect target for the cartoonist. This is Cruikshank's satirical um, uh, depiction of the Prince Regent and his extravagance. And uh, he starts on the left there as a gent um, uh, in his full uh, royal regalia, um, then sinking to become no gent. And there he is with his mistresses and uh, living it up in London and uh, raking up huge bills. And finally, as the regent, he's there as an oriental pagode. Um, he's in the pavilion at Brighton where he belongs and being made every bit of fun for the uh, crazy taste that he had down in Brighton. And his porcelain suited this taste very much down to the ground. I mean, this um, is just a, a, a typical piece of his taste in porcelain. And this is his commission from Chamberlain's. In 1807, having finished his tour of flights, he then went to Chamberlain's factory and had a good look around there and wanted to buy um, a wonderful set and placed in enormous orders for China to be made for him. Um, but, um, and they, he had to go and choose which pattern he wanted. And for uh, someone as obsessive as the prince, that was extremely difficult. He went to Chamberlain's uh, China shop in Worcester and saw samples of the patterns that they could produce. And they had a design book for him to look through. Uh, so he could choose a pattern that he wanted for his set. And that was impossible. He just couldn't make his mind up. Um, um, he was really was a, a child in a China shop. And he, he said, um, he, he, he literally said, I'll take the lot. And he really did, he, he meant it. I'll have every single pattern you can show me. And he looked through the book, one of those, one of those, right? So he ordered a dinner set, dessert set, and breakfast set, every piece to be a different pattern. Not one was to be left out. So uh, the Harlequin set to beat all Harlequins was produced. Every piece was different. And from this pattern book, the plates were produced. Here they are samples of plates. They all look like totally different sets, but they're not. All these are from the Royal Collection. These are pieces that were supplied from this wonderful order. These are part of the dessert service made for the prince. There were, uh, the dessert set alone was 190 pieces and included 96 plates like this, and each plate cost three pounds each. And that was an incredible sum of money, um, a huge cost, three pounds per plate. And there were 190 pieces in the dessert set. And the dinner set was far bigger than that. Um, it, um, the dinner set, of which here's part of it. Look at, look at this. I mean, there are some of the tureens, each one a different pattern, each plate totally different from the rest. And um, the dinner set cost £2,539. We have the orders here at the museum in the order books. So £2,500 in, um, in 1807 was a vast sum of money indeed. And this was just for the dinner set. Um, the six tureens, and here they are, just, here's one of them. There's one of these tureens, six soup tureens cost 24 pounds each, and um, amazing decorations. You can imagine this in the pavilion in Brighton, couldn't you? It belongs there. So the set finally invoiced in 1816, that was nine years after it was ordered. That's how long it, it took to finally complete the set. 
Um, but the prince hadn't paid a penny by then, and he probably didn't, and didn't end up paying for it at all. He certainly paid some of the bill, but they chased him for years to get the money for this incredible set to produce. The total bill from Chamberlain's in those same years was £4,000 for porcelain from just one factory, <laughs> and mostly for just one dinner set. And so what would he do with it? Of course, um, these sets, it really was uh, made to show off, but also um, these were used once in a while at the extravagant entertainments that the um, Prince of Wales put on. Um, the main part of the set from Chamberlain's was delivered in 1811, and that was the year the Prince, ho Prince hosted the Regency Fete. And this was, a, a, it was in honour of the King's birthday, it was a supper for 2,000 nobility and gentry. Imagine inviting 2,000 of your friends to one dinner. And uh, um, this was um, a depiction of it at the time. Um, the main table, which was for 400 guests, was set up with the grand service. And the grand service was in silver and gold. Um, the set commissioned um, by the prince from Paul Storr and the other royal jewellers. Um, and laid down the table. Um, the um, china that was used on this main table was the, uh, included the, the Serve Louis the 16th service that the Prince had just bought. This was one of the great services from pre-revolution France. Um, and the Prince, as well as commissioning new china, was a collector of the past and he collected old Serve and paid a fortune. He just paid 2000 pounds for the Louis the 16th service, and it was used at this Regency fete. Actually, it's interesting to think that the price he paid for the Louis the 16th service was actually less than the cost of a Chamberlain one. He paid even more for his Chamberlain dinner set. But I think probably the Serve one was a greater investment when you think what that might be worth today. It's, it's there safely in the Buckingham Palace and in the collection today but laid out on this table. Um, down the main table at the fete, there was a silver and marble canal um, of running water uh, from a fountain at one end, a lake at the other, and real goldfish were swimming in this canal down the length of the table, um, complete with a real fish there. Um, after the, the single uh, uh, night's uh, entertainment, one dinner was held there, and for several days afterwards, the general public was invited and were charged with admission to come and uh, look at the great um, display on the royal tables and to drool at the affluence that was on show there. Um, and uh, including the dead goldfish by then, because they hadn't done too well in the days that followed. But um, the uh, prince had so misread really the mood of the public to think that they wanted to come and see um, just how grand and how much money he'd spent on one dinner party. And lucky it didn't lead to a re revolution. But the, the Celebrity of the royal visits of the prince was nothing to the um, great fate and, and uh, 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 marvel of a bigger visit to Worcester, that not of, of, a, of a royalty, but of the great celebrity of the time. Um, no one was more famous and more welcoming to Worcester than, than Lord Nelson. Um, he came to Worcester in 1802 um, and he came down to Worcester to be, uh, he was invited to come and receive the freedom of the city. Um, in 1802, it was a rare time back, at, back from sea. Um, he was spending a, a, a few months in England back with his mistress, Lady Hamilton. And he went, uh, uh, Emma Hamilton and Lord Nelson uh, went on a grand tour of the British Isles and um, visiting all the great cities and stopping off in Worcester. Uh, where, oh, once again, he was um, invited to come and see Chamberlain's factory there. Um, in 27th of August, 1802, um, so um, Worcester was really um, excited at the visit. 
the workforce at Chamberlain's factory had erected a giant triumphal arch over the entrance to the factory, and they were keenly awaiting the uh, amazing visit of this um, hero. Um, they'd heard so much about Lord Nelson. Um, one of the painters at Worcester, James Plant, um, was, um, was expecting to see, and he wrote later an account about this visit. Um, and how disappoint, disappointed he was, because instead of this uh, huge, amazing looking hero, um, uh, out of the carriage came, uh, he described a very battered looking gentleman. He'd lost an arm and an eye, and leaning on his left and only arm was the beautiful Lady Hamilton. Um, evidently pleased, she was at the interest excited by her companion. And James Plant goes on to add that um, then, amongst the general com company following after, came a very infirm old gentleman. That was Sir William Hamilton. He was several carriages back from the crowd. But it was Emma who captured the, um, the, 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 the um, excitement of the factory workers who were there. And um, this sketch of Emma, it was painted by Thomas Baxter, who was a, a colleague of James Plant, another painter at Worcester, but not at this time. He came to Worcester a few years later. But um, during this visit of Chamberlain's factory, um, flights must have been horrified at not getting the visit. It was Chamberlain's who got the um, special visit of Nelson. And in the order books here at the museum, we can see um, the order that he placed for a dinner, dessert, and breakfast set, all to be decorated um, to special order. And um, this is the set that he commissioned to be made. Um, I mean, Nelson um, went in the China, into the shop at the factory and chose his pattern to be made. And like many, um, he chose a pattern from stock. They, he went to the most popular pattern. He, he must have asked, which is the pattern that sells best? And it was this one, pattern 240, a pattern called Old, Fine Old Japan in the Japan one, Imari taste. But the pattern alone wasn't good enough for Nelson. He wanted to go one better. So he added his own insignia, crests and badges to be painted in addition on every piece. And so the order lists the pieces that were made and how much he was charged for each one and for painting the additional crests and badges on the pieces that were made from, these are part of the breakfast set that was produced over the next two years and delivered in 1804 to um, Emma Hamilton down at Merton. And the, um, only the, bre the breakfast set was completed um, this was the teapot that went with it, um, which we have here at the museum. Um, together, there is one of the uh, chocolate cups that was produced. The teapot had the full arms of Nelson on both sides, the other pieces just the crests. And also some sample plates were made for the uh, dessert service. They were also going to have the full arms in the middle, but um, this set hadn't been Begin, begun to be completed by the time that Nelson was sadly killed at Trafalgar. And so the dessert and dinner sets were never made. And instead, we just have the breakfast set to look at and the sample plates like these. In the pattern, in the border of the Nelson service, there's a little design. If you look closely at the border, there were some birds, two little green birds, quails, are hiding amongst the foliage. On many of the pieces, there are two birds, and these were painted when um, Emma, and they represent Emma and uh, uh, Nelson, lovebirds together in the border. And some of the pieces have just one bird, one bird alone, and these were completed after Nelson had died, and they represent poor uh, Emma all alone, left behind. Well, this is the story, at least, that collectors of Nelsonia used to say when they were paying big prices for pieces from the Nelson service a long time ago. It's nonsense, of course. It's just part of the pattern, and there wasn't room for two birds on all of the pieces. But it's nice to imagine the story about and um, think of Emma and Nelson sipping their tea and drinking from this wonderful service and teapot. 
the, uh, the painter Thomas Baxter um, knew Emma um, well and painted many sketches and designs of her when he was in London. Um, but at the time of the Nelson service, he was a China painter working independently in London. And he painted this plate, which um, celebrates the or commemorates the death of Nelson at Trafalgar. And here we have Britannia mourning Nelson. But from back to sketches, we know that um, Britannia here is really Emma Hamilton dressed up and she is uh, disguised as Britannia and appears on this wonderful plate by Thomas Baxter. And Thomas Baxter was um, infatuated with Emma and uh, uh, he uh, painted her in many times, certainly when he came to Worcester. Um, uh, Thomas Baxter moved to Worcester in 1814 to join Flight Factory um, and he worked at um, Flight Bar and Bar and uh, he painted um, this vase and um, he's, he disguised it as a painting of Sappho from mythology but um, Sappho is here, um, we, we, there's no doubt at all, but it was really his own muse, um, Emma Hamilton painted on this vase by Thomas Baxter at Flight Bar and Bar. Because celebrity portraits were his speciality. And when he worked at flights, Baxter painted a series of these little cabinet cups, um, individual cups painted with portraits of the greats of the day. Um, he painted Emma, of course, on one of these cups. And also here we see uh, the likeness of the king, George III, and there's the Persian ambassador um, who was quite a, a sensation in London because of his exotic dress. And um, uh, Baxter painted these from memory from his own sketches from the people who he'd known when he was there um, in London society. Um, when he was here at Flight's factory, he painted um, perhaps um, his greatest achievement. This is Baxter's finest plate, I think. You can't get much better plate than this. Um, here, the uh, tragic muse. This is painted with another portrait of an actress that he remembered from the stage in London when he'd seen her perform many times. And um, this is um, uh, Flight Bar and Bar's plate of Sarah Siddons as the tragic muse after Joshua Reynolds. Thomas Baxter produced two of these plates. And from writings of the time, we know that they were sold to a collector in England for the massive price of 50 guineas. That was in 1815. 50, 50 guineas for one plate in 1815, that was a, a massive, massive price. But um, you can't get a much better English porcelain plate than this one. And um, the powerful painting of Siddons in the middle, it really is wonderful. Um, this plate is sadly cracked, but it's still here. And uh, uh, 30 years ago, that and I managed to be able to save this for the museum, and it's in the case behind me. And it's worth a visit to the museum alone, just a marvel at this wonderful plate by Baxter. He produced portrait medallions as well. He was a modeler as well as a painter. Baxter produced a little series of medals of his heroes. And um, here we have Nelson and the Duke of Wellington, modelled by Baxter. And Baxter also possibly did the duelling around the borders. They're uh, wonderfully finished off with jewels added to the porcelain. It's all porcelain, the frame as well. And these are made at Flight Bar and Bar and depicting the heroes of the time. For um, this was, these were news. Um, it was uh, the Duke of Wellington was just winning at Waterloo. Um, um, Baxter would have painted this little cup. Um, he painted um, a portrait of Wellington on one of his um, famous little cups. Um, and this was produced in 1815 or early in 1816. So he was finishing it just as news was reaching Worcester that the Duke had a fabulous victory at um, Waterloo. And so here is Thomas Baxter's marvellous portrait of the Duke on a tiny cup, which was kept at the factory. It passed down in the factory museum and is here to us today. But across the city, the Prince of Wales asked Chamberlains to add to his vast order a set of 12 plates. 
um, and um, he wanted some extra plates to commemorate Waterloo. Um, so 12 plates were added to the order and Chamberlain produced them with views of the scenery and the fields and, and landscapes around Waterloo. Perhaps they were going to be a gift for the Duke of Wellington, um, something along the lines of the sets made at Sèvres and uh, Meissen and uh, Berlin for the Duke of Wellington. But perhaps the prince liked his own porcelain too much and never let them go. He kept them himself and they're still in the royal collection today rather than in Apsley House. So these, uh, the Prince of Wales hung, hung on to his plates made by Chamberlain with views of Waterloo. But here at the museum, we have a rather more splendid piece um, than, than any because of the sheer size, a giant vase. This was produced at Chamberlain. And here we have the Duke of Wellington meeting with Lucia at the field of Waterloo. Um, a great battle scene painted on the front of a monumental vase made at Chamberlain's. Um, it was kept at the factory, presumably because they couldn't find a customer for it at the time. It would have been a hugely expensive piece to make, but a great thing to display how wonderful the factory was and to get more orders as a result. And it's great that it stayed in the factory because it's here in the museum for everyone to enjoy today. The same shape of vase was made, though smaller, um, to celebrate the, uh, the um, Princess Charlotte. Um, the, um, her marriage, the uh, England's hope in Charlotte, the beautiful Princess Charlotte, um, her marriage in 1816 was the great, great royal event of the time. And um, for the um, wedding, um, all the china factories in England wanted to produce special china sets to commemorate it. Um, and um, the, the uh, 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 different um, manufacturers were asked to send samples for a special marriage set to be made. Um, these pieces were specimens probably just made as a bribe for Chamberlain was determined to get the royal order for the marriage set. And so, so they produced a plate um, just, just with the arms of um, Charlotte and Leopold painted. You can't get more detail in the coat of arms on one porcelain plate than this piece made at Chamberlain's. It has to be the ultimate royal armorial plate. It's, it's a marvelous thing indeed, just made to show off. And it's here at the museum. But, um, the vase painted by Humphrey Chamberlain Jr. They, uh, and the, the princess and prince did order indeed a set to be made by Chamberlain's. This was the pattern, but um, Charlotte apparently didn't want the royal arms. She had so much china at home with crowns and unicorns and lions. She was heartily sick of them and wanted something else. And so she chose from the pattern book um, this design with fancy birds in the panels by George Davis. Um, a, a lovely set, um, still lavish and rich. This set um, was costed at two guineas per plate. So each plate in the set made by Chamberlain's at two guineas each. And these were then produced for the wedding. But it wasn't just Chamberlain who got the order. Um, she also ordered one from flights. And this is the flight set that was made. The plate on the left there is the flights um, example from the same um, uh, wedding set. And this was um, painted by astles with flowers and raised gold all around. Um, flight plates also cost two guineas per plate. Um, so it was clearly a fix. They price fixed it and agreed to both charge the same amount. But it's interesting that the Chamberlain charged two guineas, and that's a pound less than they charged the Prince of Wales. So it's all open for negotiation if you can try it. But then getting the patronage was so important. Chamberlain were the manufacturers now to the Prince Regent and also Princess Charlotte and Prince Leopold. And they proudly put that on their marks. And that meant you got other orders. Um, this set, um, you could buy a pattern from stock. Most people didn't have a special order. They would just choose nice patterns because of the reputation of the factory. 
um, flights. Uh, later on, 1839, uh, this one was the wedding set for Benjamin Disraeli. And everyone who wanted a nice quality wedding set for their marriage would have a set made by flights and bar and by Chamberlain's because they were the royal manufacturers. There was this huge rivalry between these makers. Um, both were desperate to get the, the um, orders. And when any special visitor was coming to Worcester, they would be, um, try their hardest to persuade them to come to their factory rather than their rivals. And the, it was the sister of the Tsar of Russia who was persuaded to go to flights for a tour of the factory. And she chose a set to be made for her brother. It was a present for her brother, the um, Tsar Alexander I. And flights painted the Russian royal arms in the middle. And look at that gilding. That's all raised up on the surface, um, hugely costly um, to produce each plate. Um, and uh, the quality indeed of the best uh, English porcelain you could get. Um, uh, we don't know what Alexander thought about it because he had his own factory making porcelain for him in Russia, but this was quite something to marvel at. But, but other customers went down the road to Chamberlain's and perhaps the, the greatest set of all of the time, you couldn't get much better than this, was made uh, not for a royal but for a lord. This is the we became the Marquis of Abergavenny. This was made for Lord Neville. And his set, um, ordered in 1814, was really uh, quite outstanding. Um, and the full extent of the order, one can understand from looking through the archives here, and the order book survives, so you can see what was made. There was a full dinner service and a full tea and breakfast service. These were set patterns. This is the Trafalgar border but with um, room for the entire coat of arms of the Neville family, carefully painted on every single piece at great expense. And in addition to the dinner set and the tea service, there were also extra ornaments made, and it's the ornaments that are quite something that um, we can marvel at. Um, Looking down the list, there were um, a set of vases. These are regent ornaments, the shape named after the Prince Regent in his honor. Um, the, there was a set of seven of these were produced um, with different scenes from Shakespeare painted on each. The seven vases costing an incredible 60 pounds there in the order books. A single ink well was made, an ink stand, for, the, for Lord Neville's desk. Here it is, painted by Humphrey Chamberlain Jr. Um, on the front. And here, the new long ink, it was described in the order, um, with fawn and figures, it cost 15 guineas just for this one inkwell. And um, underneath the list, it lists the inkwell there at 15 guineas, it says models for crest, three guineas. Um, that's the bull's head on the top. For the finial on the lid of the inkwell, um, the, the Lord Neville had his own family crest of a bull modelled as the finial. So to make a mould specially just for this one inkwell, they charged him an extra three guineas. And so you could have your own crest put on top of the lid on your inkwell. Uh, that's the way to live, isn't it? And uh, at the, finally, in the order, we have the uh, grace mugs, two grace mugs for saying grace, or which means having a wonderful toast. Um, and the toasting mugs are two giant double quart mugs, two quarts each, full of strong liquor, passing them around amongst Lord Neville's guests, uh, drinking his toast. Uh, aren't they fantastic? Painted by Humphrey Chamberlain there. Um, and there they are in the order books, 40 guineas they cost, just for one pair, the most, the most expensive single thing in the Chamberlain order books um, of all. Nothing cost more than the pair of grace mugs, but what a pair they really are. Um, it was 50 years ago that my dad managed to save these for the museum. They were up for sale in London. Uh, he managed to get local benefactors 
to stump up the money and save them. And they were brought here to Worcester, where they've been ever since, and where they were made um, all that time ago. Painted by Humphrey Chamberlain Jr., um, the son of the of factory's owner, and one of the great painters of the time. William IV finally became king in 1830. Um, and he remembered his old friends at flights and had a service made for himself. Um, the uh, William IV service by flights um, ordered in 1830 and uh, completed only three years later. It wasn't too bad, three years to make one set, but what a set it was and used there for the first time in 1833. Um, and it, nice, it's still used uh, every year for the Ungarta Day, for the Garter Day lunch, the royal family, uh, the Queen entertains with the flight set still being used. In rotation, these sets are brought out um, once in a while for special occasions. And it's nice to think this set is still used. But I think, to be honest, they, they put the set out to begin with and then they take the plates away and replace them with something a bit plainer to eat the food off. You don't rub your knife and fork against the amazing gilding here by John Bly. Um, and little Princess Victoria um, was only nine years old when she came to Chamberlain's on a tour and um, uh, started buying porcelain from Chamberlain's. Incredible, nine years old. It's like me, I was nine years old when I was taking tour parties around the, muse around the factory here in Worcester, the same uh, route that Princess Victoria took when she came to Worcester with her mother um, in 1828. Um, uh, the princess um, was... Um, uh, it was a little bit of a, 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 a joke. It was, wasn't the, the princess herself, I think, who was ordering the porcelain. In the Chamberlain books, it shows Princess Victoria ordering sets of chinaware to, to be given as presents. And that was what was produced. This little plate, this plate is tiny. It's only a little doll's house size plate, a child's plate, and a little miniature uh, sugar bowl uh, made of a view of Malvern. And her mother, the Duchess of Kent, was determined that um, her daughter was going to be queen one day. The royal succession line wasn't totally clear cut. And so they went on a grand tour around the country and came to Worcester and um, uh, had these little plates made. And they would then be given, uh, the little princess would hand these um, on behalf of her mother to anyone who mattered, who could give influence in, in the country and in parliament to say, my daughter Victoria is going to be the Queen one day. So there's the Queen's crown and the letter V for Victoria to make sure that she's going to be Queen. And thanks to the little Chamberlain plates, it all came to be. And a few years later, Queen Victoria um, came to the throne. But sadly, um, she didn't give Chamberlain the recognition they deserved. No big orders from Chamberlain for the coronation of Victoria. For some reason, Victoria likes Minton. I can't think why. Um, and poor old Worcester missed out on that occasion. But the, um, perhaps um, um, at the time, um, royal tours of England were being done by others. And um, these are the uh, one of the first celebrity pop, pop groups that went on a grand tour of England. This is the Rayner family. Um, and they toured the country in 1827. And Chamberlain made these figures of them. Uh, the Rayners were a singing troupe from the Tyrol. They were, um, they, they sang unique vocal harmony, um, including yodeling which must have been quite something to hear and to, and, and it was a spectacular, apparently. Um, their speciality was a new song that they'd written or written for them called Silent Night. And uh, we all know Silent, Silent Night today, um, but I don't think it was, would have been particularly silent, um, accompanied by yodeling and knee slapping in the Tyrolean way. And somehow the performance of the Rayner family must have been seen to be believed. And so uh, they went around the country and the Prince of Wales, they performed for the Prince of Wales, while well, he was now George IV, the king now. 
um, and um, uh, he wanted to give them a present. And so um, they, um, when they came to visit the prince, he had some old um, uh, paraphernalia left over from the coronation, Prince of Wales plumes and things like that. And he gave them to the Rayner family who for years proudly wore them in their hats. So here they are in their incredible hats with the Prince of Wales flume, plumes during their singing and dancing and the figures made by Chamberlain to celebrate it. Not very many were sold. But the finally, perhaps the most celebrated pop star of all um, came to Worcester in 1850, and that was Jenny Lind, um, the uh, Swedish nightingale, one of the great singers of her day. And uh, she went on a, a grand tour again around Britain, um, giving charity concerts with her amazing, um, beautiful voice. And uh, uh, there was uh, Chamberlain's produced a set uh, as a presentation for Jenny Lind. Um, this was the set. Um, the illustration here from the Illustrated London News shows the set that Chamberlain's had made specially for her. Um, it's their double walled pierced porcelain, which was something quite new to be made in England, made here by Chamberlain's. And for a special set, they made the finials on the top of the uh, covers, on top of the stoppers, um, in the shape of little birds. Um, I think they're meant to be nightingales in her honour, but they look more like canaries, but they would have sung beautifully, and they produced this set and proudly announced they're giving it to Jenny Lind. Um, but then, uh, to shock and horror, she refused it. She wouldn't accept the gift from Chamberlain's because she insisted that all her concerts were done only for charity and she wouldn't want any to benefit herself in any way. So she, she, she refused the Chamberlain set and they had to sell it to, to somebody else, um, which was a bit of a shock uh, to poor old Chamberlain's. But uh, they got their own back um, as a few years later, um, they modeled her as diffidence and confidence to snuff out a candle. Um, it serves Jenny Lind right, she should have accepted the Chamberlain gift. Instead, here at Worcester, we remember her not as a singer, but as candle snuffers to, to douse your flame. And the most famous pair of Worcester snuffers here of the Nightingales um, uh, made in 1880. Uh, it's on this happy musical note that I'm gonna end my chat to you today. Thank you very much.